builders. The invited foreigners gathered at the home of the priest. You know what events then transpired? Because it happened that one of the mourners later told a friend, Miss Gertrude Hope. By further happy accident, Miss Hope was a member of the Folklore Society and took it upon herself to compose a detailed account of the proceedings, which was subsequently published in the Society's journal as follows. The minister of the chapel where the deceased woman had been a regular attendant held a short service in the cottage before the coffin was removed. The lady who gave me the particulars arrived rather early and found the bearers enjoying a good lunch in the only downstairs room. Shortly afterwards, the coffin was brought down and was placed on two chairs in the centre of the room. And the mourners having gathered round, gathered round it, the service proceeded. Directly the minister ended, the woman in charge of the arrangements poured out four glasses of wine and handed one to each bearer present across the coffin with a biscuit called a funeral biscuit. The biscuits were ordinary sponge fingers, usually called sponge fingers or ladies fingers. They are, however, also known in the shops of Market Drayton as funeral biscuits. The minister, who had lately come from Pembrokeshire, remarked to my informant that he was sorry to see that pagan custom still observed. We had been able to put an end to it in a Pembrokeshire village where he had formerly been. The ritualised consumption of biscuits, cakes, or occasionally loaves at funerals was by no means a localised curiosity. It is in fact well attested all over the British Isles during the later 19th and earlier 20th centuries. In the Derbyshire village of Eden, for instance, the cakes were reportedly triangular and spiced with currants. The burnt wine or burnt drink which accompanied the cakes was described by the contemporary folklorist Sidney Oldall Abbey as a dark looking liquid with a strongly aromatic smell and consisted of ale spiced with cloves, nutmeg, ginger and mace. Addy further noted how this concoction was served in a single tankard, which was shared between the mourners, and that it and the round willow basket in which the, the biscuits were presented was usually kept especially for use at funerals. This custom of providing mourners with biscuits or cakes and an alcoholic drink appears to already have been well established, at least amongst the wealthier echelons of English society, as early as the 14th century. The earliest records refer simply to wine, although by the 17th century, household manuals and account books, undertakers' bills and other sources were making specific reference to sack, claret and cannery. By the early 18th century, it appears to become a normal practice to serve the wine hot. For example, in 1719, the French traveller Henri Masson noted of the English funeral gatherings how before they set out and after they return, it is usual to present the guests with something to drink, either red or white wine, boiled with sugar and cinnamon or some such liquor. While there is no mention of biscuits in this particular account, we do know from other sources that it was also customary to serve biscuits or cake, the words are often interchangeable in this context, at the funerals of the well-to-do during this period. These came in a variety of flavours, textures, shapes and sizes, but during the 18th and early 19th centuries, the most fashionable were the Naples or Savoy variety, made with such exotic ingredients as, al ingredients as almonds, rose water, musk and ambergris. By the Victorian period, the recipes had become greatly simplified, as the custom was taken up by those lower down the social scale and of more modest means. Recipe books from this period indicate that there were two basic types of funeral biscuits. Matt, could I ask you to distribute those, please? The first types were sponge biscuits, which for fairly obvious reasons were sometimes called coffins and sometimes also flavoured with currants. And the second was a type of caraway shortcake, which might either be coffin shaped or alternatively circular and stamped with a decorated mould of the type illustrated here. There's some suggestion that the designs may have varied according to locality and the fact that these moulds survive in fairly good condition and fairly large numbers suggests that they were carefully looked after by their owners and, and passed down. Um, just handed out some funeral biscuit recipes that you, uh, you, you may wish to try yourselves. Um, I've, I've had mixed results but uh, have, have a go if you like. It was also customary for the bereaved 
family to distribute an initial round of these biscuits as part of the process of inviting or bidding guests to the funeral. This was done by a bidder wearing mourning who would knock on the door and announce in a formulaic manner that you are expected to attend John Smith's burying tomorrow at three o'clock, we bury at wherever. Sometimes the, the bidder would be a relative or neighbour, as in the following account from Cumberland. Two women, usually neighbours, who had attended and performed the last rites for the deceased, that's playing out, <laughs> went around to houses in the locality to bid people to the funeral. The custom is still common. At Low Row in the Brampton area, it is undertaken by men, usually on horseback, and no one attends a funeral unless previously bidden. This account, clearly written in the present tense, was published in Folklore Journal as late as 1929. Sometimes it would have been the undertaker or confectioner or his assistant who carried out this task. Mother's Sheffield Songs includes a folk song about round legs, thought to have been the assistant to George Pierce, confectioner of Grindelgate in the city, whose funeral biscuits were famous in the area. And it goes like this. Round legs to Wadsley went, with burying cakes he was sent. Round legs tumbled over a wall, let all his spice cakes fall. In some regions, it was the accepted custom to invite everyone within a certain defined geographical area. It was considered rude not to attend without very pressing reason, but conversely, as per the Brampton example, it was socially unthinkable to attend a funeral without having been bidden in this manner. The biscuits would usually be wrapped in pairs in white paper, printed on one side with a black border and suitably lugubrious verses and images which reminded the recipients in no uncertain terms of their own mortality. Being so ephemeral, this rare surviving example here is especially precious. The wrapped packet would have been sealed with black wax, you can probably just see a little bit on there, and tied up with black ribbon. And it's clear then that this custom of providing biscuits and burnt wine at funerals is historically old. It's also evident that a deal of trouble and expense was undertaken in the provision of these refreshments. For instance, the folklore journal correspondent T.W. Thompson observed how even the poor had one bottle of port of which everyone must taste. This alludes to the customs importance as a means of advertising and establishing social respectability, of demonstrating that however modest the family's means, they were both aware of and capable of fulfilling these conventions of hospitality and neighbourliness. So how, I'm sorry, we've, we've lost our images unfortunately. It's all right, we can, we can carry on, we can leave it there. So how to interpret these bidding, baking and waking customs at Victorian and slightly later English funerals? Well, firstly, for the interpretations of the folklorists themselves. Miss, Miss Hope, whose account we began with, highlights the grudging acquiescence of the clergy to a popular custom perceived as the remnant of a morally suspect and probably not entirely Christian practice. Her letter to Folklore Journal opens with reference to an article that they recently published by uh, Edwin Sidney Hartland. And in that article, Hartland had asserted the custom of distributing biscuits and wine at funerals to be an equation not remotely related to that known in Wales in the marches as sin eating. A sin eating. The sin eater was a man who was paid a small sum to receive over the coffin when the dead body was brought out of the house immediately before the procession started bread or cake or cheese, a beer with wine and milk, or whatever, to be then and there consumed. And by doing so, he was held to take upon him the sins of the deceased and thus free the latter from, um, so free the latter to, to carry on in, into the afterlife and burden put by sin. Now, this disassociation of these two customs enjoys considerable pop popularity uh, into the present day, if, if another reason than sheer curiosity value, but, um, that there's no documentary evidence of a link between the customs of sin eating and distributing funeral biscuits and uh, there are various other reasons why it's not it is difficult to prove it's a theory it's, it's, it's an interesting theory but that's as far as it goes um sin eating was not however the only survivalist exp explanation put forward by contemporary folklorists canon john christopher atkinson's reminiscence of his 40 years serving in the yorkshire moorland parish 
included the story that <coughs> sometime during the late 1860s, he chanced to observe a dish of small crisp sponges on display at a confectioner's shop in the North Yorkshire coastal town of Whitby. And inqu on inquiring, he was informed by the shopkeeper that the biscuits were not for sale, but had been baked to order for a funeral, and that they were known to the locals as Avril breads. Um, Atkinson was a keen um, amateur philologist, so he immediately pounced on the lexical similarity between this and the old northeastern dialect word um, Arvel, Avril, Arvel, uh, donating a succession ale custom from, from Viking times by which heirs to the deceased person were formally recognised. Like other varieties of survival explanation, it's, it's possible that Atkinson's theory may contain a little grain of truth because the, the dialect of northeastern England has indeed been heavily influenced by the region of Scandinavian heritage. That said, this fails to explain the prevalence of the custom right across the British Isles, and ultimately, there's no, again, there's no documentary trail to support that theory. Yet another variety of survivalist explanation for this, this customary distribution custom is that it was a hangover from medieval Catholicism, the funeral mass transposed post-Reformation into the informal domestic realm of folklore. This theory has attracted some support from present-day historians. For instance, Ruth Richardson writes that it is hard not to infer some confused relationship with the sacrament. Indeed, it seems likely that there was a vague association with the celebration of Holy Communion at funerals prior to 1552. So there certainly are a few theories around the origins of Victorian funeral hospitality customs. However, these do ultimately remain theories without documentary provenance. And in any case, the theories of origin don't necessarily tell us about the meaning of these customs as they were experienced by people centuries later. Um, thanks to the survivors' preoccupations, however, of those doing the recording, and this is, this is a problem generally with this type of source, um, it is difficult to reconstruct their contemporary meanings. They tended to get, go out and get lots of interesting information on, on what people were doing, and then sort of pile their own theories on it without actually thinking to um, ask what the customers meant to people themselves. This is, this is antiquarianism we're dealing with here, not modern professional ethnography and the sources kind of are what they are in, in a way um, so um, when I was trying to sort of think about what these customs might have meant and how they might have been experienced people in Victorian and early 20th century England I, I find myself turning to um, insights from social anthropology um, Notably, I refer here to Mary Douglas's work on the symbolism of funeral food, which alerts us to the contrast that mourners at a Victorian funeral would have experienced between the, the relatively fluid, attenuated and restrained nature of the hospitality that biscuits and burnt wine provided before the funeral services, and the quality and variety of quite substantial food and drink provided at the funeral tea after burial service. Thus, within this ritual grammar of funeral hospitality customs, the funeral tea, you could say, functioned as a symbolic punctuation mark, a managed shifting mood from sadness and reflection to one of anticipating the future and the ongoing business of life. Indeed, Douglas Davis has coined the food phrase food against death in order to articulate how there is no better way of expressing the positive, I'm quoting Davis here, an ongoing nature of life than by sharing food together, expressing as it does the sustaining of life and working for the future, just as fasting or eating very little is a way of showing corporate discipline in the face of the potentially destructive elements of life. When alcohol is drunk, as it is at funerals in many parts of the world, it also conduces to an increased sense of well-being. Parties are often accompanied by noise, by much talking and by general bustle, as opposed to the restrained and silent hours of morning before the funerals, again, that symbolic contrast between the different stages of the ritual process. Um, one is reminded here of Henry Fairfax Blakebridge by reservation, by observation in 1935, of the, and I quote, curious idea in rural Yorkshire that port wine is a teetotal drink. And cases have been known 
of staunch teetotalers rather overstepping the mark at funerals. That said, before we get overly nostalgic for old customs sadly lost, it's important also to acknowledge that this, what we might call a moral economy of Victorian funeral hospitality also processed a shadow side. Notably, this was manifested in the form of obligation to put on a display which met the standards set by previous events. It is quite a common thing, noted local historian J.S. Fletcher writing in the 1880s, to hear Yorkshire folk discuss the celebration of a funeral and to pass criticism and judgment according to the repasts and collations provided. I don't call that much of a do, the critic will observe. It buried in the coal down. Now I've put away three children and they're all buried with roast, roast beef and plum pudding. However, for those who did get it right, there was a reward of social approval. Fletcher again. I have more than once heard friends on taking their leave after the funeral tea give such comforting assurance to the brief family as the following. Well, no one can say what you've given him in a most beautiful and respectable funeral. You've done everything by you could, there's no two ways about that. So I, I'd, I'd sort of like to um, start to conclude with some very brief thoughts about funeral hospitality customs going then through the 20th century and on into the present day. From the mid, um, in the mid-1930s, and especially in the decades immediately following the Second World War, the American-style Chapel of Rest very much came into fashion. So customs such as a lifting ceremony with which we started this talk became obsolete. More, more widely, families and friendship groups have become increasingly geographically dispersed, and neighbours are usually far less prominent in our social networks. So physically going around bidding to funerals with the accompanying accoutrement is impracticable. The task of bidding is still performed, but it's nowadays facilitated by the relatively impersonal and dematerialized technologies of the newspaper announcements, the telephone, and more likely social media. The custom of the funeral tea does largely survive in more or less recognizable form, although its production is nowadays typically outsourced to a commercial provider usually a pub or, or sometimes a restaurant. As alluded to earlier, this trend was in fact already emerging back in the mid-Victorian period. Remember those arval breads for sale in Whitby? As the pace of life gets ever busier, and in particular with the increased participation of women in the workplace, because there's a whole dot gender dimension to this too, this outsourcing of funeral hospitality customs, it could be understood as an impoverishment of tradition, or it could be understood as a creative innovation in which new technologies facilitate the continuation <coughs> of this most significant ritual punctuation mark in the funeral proceedings. So to finally conclude, this account of Victorian vernacular funeral hospitality customs has a hope indicated that we're, we're dealing far, with far more here than merely a fragmented collection of miscellaneous curios or wanton extravagances. What I suggest we actually have going on here is nothing less than fully fledged what we as historians might call a moral economy, a coherent, purposeful, meaningful tissue of reciprocal customary relations. Moreover, this customary economy encompasses not just the community's living members, but facilitates interaction and relationship negotiation between the still living and the, and the, and the if you like, becoming ancestors. And this in turn has something I believe very useful to teach us nowadays about facing up to the inevitable. Whilst death is an individual event, dying is a social process in which we're all from time to time, and whether we like it or not, called to play our parts as family, friends, neighbours and colleagues. And in such socially and emotionally charged situations, more or less shared and mutually understood funeral customs constitute arguably a framework of action enabling us collectively to express human solidarity with the dying, dead and bereaved. And in doing this, we ultimately stand up, if momentarily but still powerfully, against mortality itself. Thank you. <laughs>